As we start out the solutions chapter, I want to talk about, you know, what is going on? Why are we talking about solutions? What do we mean? We've talked about solids. We've talked about gases. We've talked about liquids some, but now we're really going to talk about a solution. What really is a solution? Solution can be homogeneous or heterogeneous mixtures. Um, We can talk about pure solvent, where it's just one component, a mixture of something, again, whether homogeneous or heterogeneous, all these terms we've learned in the first semester. But one thing I want to talk about in this chapter is what is going on at the molecular level when solutions are formed. Again, this, the way I have this written is assuming a solution is a mixture of one, um, two or more components. So what's actually happening at the molecular level? In the picture we have shown here, we have oil and water. All of us logically know that oil and water don't mix. We don't really probably think about why they don't mix. Why when you walk through a parking lot and you see some water on the ground, it looks rainbow effect on top. Why is that oil floating on top of the water? Why do they not mix? Why do we see if I have a beaker full of water and put some vegetable oil in it, why does it look like the picture on the slide? So we want to talk about the solubility rule. And within that, like dissolves like. What is the solubility rule? The solubility rule is simplified to say like dissolves like. What that means is that proper um, systems with similar properties will dissolve one another. Why does oil not dissolve in water, but sugar does? And what are the properties of solutions? How can we describe a solution? And we're going to really delve into that in this chapter and then use those properties to understand behaviors of different solutions. So lots of terms go into here. So this section um, is really talking about solutions. This whole um, unit or module is talking about solutions and trying to get you to kind of understand better some of the terminology. And if you didn't know this already, I absolutely adore penguins. So I love this little cartoon I found for solubility. I think it's hilarious. Hopefully you do too. But solubility, what is solubility? Solubility is defined as the amount of substance that will saturate a given amount of solvent at a given temperature. Now, there's some terms in there as well. We've got saturate, we've got solvent. You know, we already understand kind of temperature. What do you really mean here? How much of something will actually dissolve in a specific solvent? Solvent is what you are dissolving it in. So as for the cartoon here, it says, I can't get this coffee to dissolve. Did you by chance try boiling the water? So I personally don't drink coffee, but I love hot chocolate. So if I was to drink hot chocolate, you know, I naturally make the water warm anyway because I expect it to be hot chocolate. But coffee is going to dissolve better. There is cold coffees, yes, but traditionally coffee dissolves in hot water. Solubility is dependent upon temperature. How much will dissolve is dependent upon temperature. It's dependent actually on the attractive forces between the solute and solvent molecules. In chapter um, 12, module 12, we talk a lot about intermolecular forces and what's holding these molecules together. In this chapter, those all come back and we start talking about these intermolecular forces, but with instead of within just a single substance, in between the solvent and solute as well. Solubility is temperature dependent, and we typically represent this in units of grams per liter. So for example, by the temperature dependency, Sodium acetate at zero degrees C, I can dissolve 119 grams of sodium acetate in 100 milliliters of water. If I heated that solution up to 100 degrees C, I can actually dissolve 170 grams of sodium acetate in 100 grams of water. Some substances, truthfully most substances, are more soluble as I increase the temperature when it's a solid going into a liquid. Sometimes it's an opposite case, and we'll talk about that, and we'll see, like, um, with solids and solubility, temperature versus gases as we increase temperature, etc. And we'll see how that's all kind of affected, but we'll talk about that in a different submodule. We also have two terms here that we need to understand, miscible and emiscible. You may already know these terms, and if you do, that's fantastic. But if not, I need you to try to think about this in your mind's eye. Miscible is two liquids that are completely soluble in all proportions, meaning they will mix in any ratio. Water and ethanol are like this. Ethanol is an alcohol. It's actually what's put into alcohol that we drink as humans. And these can be 
um, mixed in any proportion, meaning I can have anywhere from 0.1 milliliters, if I have a 100 ml solution, I can have as little as say, or 0.1% ethanol and 99.9% water all the way to point um 99.9 percent .9 ethanol with only 0.1 percent water it can mix in any ratio emissible is two liquids that are going to form separate layers or look and appear to be insoluble such as water and oil some more terms solution and solute versus solvent so a solution we're going to define it as a homogeneous mixture of the solute plus the solvent Again, homogeneous just means that it is, has an even uh, mixing. It is completely the same solution throughout. So like milk is a homogeneous mixture. If I take a sample of milk and I analyze it, and I take a sample from the top of the carton, and I take a sample from the bottom of the carton, I should find that I have the exact same composition in both spots. If I took um, um, something that like, uh, it's not quite the same thing, but let's say I took ice water, the temperature at the top of the water glass would be lower than the temperature at the bottom. That would be considered heterogeneous in the sense of temperature. I don't have a great example for heterogeneous in my mind. I apologize. I don't, I can't think of something off the top of my head that would be heterogeneous. Um, but technically a solution is defined as a homogeneous mixture. So something that is completely mixed the same throughout. We also have aqueous solution. Hopefully that term is a repeat term for you, but as a review, aqueous just means, <coughs> excuse me, that solution was with, mixed with water, whereas water is our solvent. What do we mean by solute versus solvent? This is a little tricky. If both components were originally in the same phase, the solvent is the component present in greater amount. For example, beer. If I have a beer that is a 6% ethanol content, 6% ethanol in water. That means there's 6% ethanol, 94% water. Water's greater, water's present in the greater amount, therefore water is my solvent. Ethanol and water are both liquids at room temperature. Everclear, however, has a 95% ethanol content, meaning that it only has a 5% water content. In this case, ethanol is my solvent because it's present in the greater amount and the both substances were originally in the same phase. Now, if both components were originally in different phases, the compound that does not change phase is the solvent. So if sucrose, if I dissolved sucrose in water, sucrose is a solid at room temperature, water is a liquid the sucrose will dissolve and go into the solution. In that case, the sucrose is changing phase. So therefore, by definition, the sucrose is my solute. 135 grams of sucrose in 100 grams of water at 100 degrees C, but water is still the solvent, even though it was technically present in a smaller amount. So solute, what did you dissolve? And that either changed phase or if both solvent and solute were in the same phase, it was present in the smaller amount. Solvent, what did you dissolve it in? So it's either the component that did not change phase at all, or if they were both in the same phase to start, it's the um, substance that was present in a greater amount. We also have saturated, unsaturated, super saturated, and a colloidal dispension. So saturated is when the maximum mass of solute dissolved at a given temperature has been reached, meaning if I add more solid, no more can dissolve. Everything has a saturation limit. Even if we say, okay, sodium chloride, sodium chloride dissolves in water. Yeah, but eventually I will add enough sodium chloride to that water that no more will dissolve. At that point, the solution has been saturated. You're gonna learn more about equilibrium very soon actually, but you're going to see that what's actually happening in solution is what's pictured here. And we see our sodium chloride is breaking apart into sodium ions and chloride ions. I know we've talked about that before. We're talking about it again. We've got the sodium chloride here, and it's slowly breaking apart into little chloride ions and little sodium ions that are surrounded by water molecules. When we reach a saturation point or a saturated solution, this reaches an equilibrium, meaning that we've got sodium chloride ions, or sodium chloride um, 
Sodium chloride is a formula unit. It's a large crystal. But that's breaking apart into sodium ions and chloride ions. But it's doing it at a certain rate where the reverse is also happening. Hence the arrows here. This means it's in equilibrium or the reaction goes forward and backward direction. We end up with enough sodium ions and chloride ions in solution that they can't ignore each other anymore. And some, some of those sodium ions find some of those chloride ions again and they reform their solid. Hence the picture on the bottom. We've got dissolution. So the chloride ions, the sodium ions breaking apart and being surrounded by the water molecules. And then we've got what we call recrystallization. These two are coming back together and reforming their crystal. At a saturated point, no additional solute will dissolve. In a saturated solution in equilibrium, and again, you will learn, and we'll do an entire chapter on equilibrium and then more chapters on more specific systems of equilibrium, but an equilibrium exists between the solid solute and dissolved solute, and it's going back and forth at the same rate so that we don't notice it from a bird's eye view, but at the molecular level, these systems are constantly changing. We've got sodium chloride breaking apart, other sodium chloride ions recrystallizing. Quickest way to saturate a solution, we did this in lab a lot, if we need like a saturated solution of sodium chloride as a common solution used in organic chemistry, we will take a large amount of sodium chloride and pour it in some water into whatever solution we need, however much water we need. We'll then shake it like crazy to get, give it energy to dissolve those particles apart, dissolve, those, um, dissolve that crystal and form those ions. If all of the salt dissolves, we add more. Because if all the salt dissolves, there's no salt present, we haven't reached a saturated state yet. We keep adding and adding and shaking and shaking until eventually we have a little bit of salt left over. At that point, we know the solution has been saturated because there's solid crashing out at the bottom. Unsaturated just means we haven't reached that saturation point yet. If we have an unsaturated solution, more, sol uh, more sol solvent can dissolve more of our solute that should say more um the g is saying more solvent can dissolve or more solute or actually better let's just fix this i never noticed this before i apologize more solute can dissolve in the solvent at a given temperature by given volume of water again water doesn't have to be your solvent it's just the most common one we talk about you, Anything can be your solvent, but water is traditionally the solvent we talk about, and if we're talking about aqueous solutions, it is water as our solvent. Additional solute will dissolve. If we have a super saturated solution, this is a special case where it's a metastable compound where we actually dissolved more solute than we should at that temperature. It's actually an unstable system, and solution will fall out, or the solution will precipitate when the system is just um, disturbed. The way we usually create a supersaturated solution is we mix it quickly, we heat up the sample, all of it goes into solution, we then let it cool slowly, and if we don't disturb it, it will often dissolve more solute than it should based on the temperature when it cools down. And a colloidal um, dispersion is also another system you can have. That's when you have particles that range from 1 to 1,000 nanometers in diameter, and they produce a cloudy or turbid appearance. Turbid is another word for cloudy. You see this a lot in the organic lab where you've got a solution, you're like, okay, but that's not clear to look through anymore. And by clear, I don't mean like water color. I mean, like, it can be a colored solution, but you can see right through it. It's completely transparent. Turbid or cloudy means like an opaque appearance to the solution. This happens when you've got a colloidal dispersion. This is, there's suspensions in here. Um, you can also have a suspension instead of a colloidal dispersion where the particles are greater than one micrometer in size and the solute slowly settles out. Oftentimes when we have solutions like this, we will, um, you, instead of just filtering, we'll use like a centrifuge or something else to pull those particles down a little bit faster. And just to kind of show you what, a picture of what these things look like, adding a solute to a supersaturated solution of sodium acetate. Again, supersaturated is when we have more solute dissolved. Remember, solute and solvent, those words are very similar. In this case, my solute is sodium acetate. And my solvent is water. 
And what that means is in this first picture here, I have more sodium acetate dissolved than I should for the temperature I'm at. So I'm slowly adding more to it. And what I see is these crystals crash out and we see them start to grow. And that's where you get these long needle-like crystals. Different systems will do different crystal structures. And then we see this system happen where it all that sodium acetate crashes out because the amount of water we have is not enough to keep all of that solute in solution.